I'd just like to echo Stephen in thanking um, everybody at BAC for supporting me over the last two months. I'm, as uh, as Jill said, I'm a research and residence in here, and um, I'm working on a new project which later on, after the break, I'm going to sort of stage a, a sort of work in progress rehearsal for you. Um, but what I'm going to do now is very, very quickly uh, follow on from Steve's presentation and talk to you about a, a project that I did um, immediately following the um, screen, the, the uh, Milgram reenactment. Uh, Steve just showed you a screenshot of that a second ago um, in 2004. And um, in some ways, it follows neatly on from Steve's presentation, and it deals with very much with this idea of, of the social studio that Steve talks about. Um, but it, it, and it also investigates the, the idea of kind of behavioural systems and the way in which um, people maybe or maybe not can be influenced to behave in certain ways. Um, but it traces um, a, a different kind of history, actually. And this is the history that, that Steve didn't talk about of these behavioural experiments um, that, that were investigated by the military at, at around the same time that the um, sort of nascent M MIT lab was being started up. And what happened to these experiments, as I think we all kind of know now, actually, is that they, they, they manifested themselves in um, what, what are now public CIA interrogation manuals and um, um, CIA inter interrogation <coughs> uh, techniques that, that um, primarily focus around psych psychological um, intervention in, into the human subject in order to um, break them down or do whatever it is they want to do. This kind of begins, the, the hidden history of this begins really in the Korean War with um, POWs, American POWs returning back to America, having apparently been converted to communism. And the CIA at that point was obviously very worried about this phenomena and, and wants to find a way of, in a way, creating their own subjects, their own kind of subjects who then they can influence in the, way that they, um, in the way that they desire, whether it be taking communists and turning them to capitalists or whatever, whatever it is. They want to do this through technological means, though, and they turn to these cybernetic methods that Steve's been talking about, start experimenting with different types of social control. And this, in a sense, <coughs> has an interesting combination in 1993, when um, a standoff between the uh, ATF and a small religious community in Waco, in Texas, goes horribly wrong. And the FBI are brought in to manage the situation the religious group in question is a group called the Brock Civilians, and they're, they're sort of, uh, the community leader is called David Koresh. And very, very quickly after this kind of, um, after this, uh, this uh, assault by the ATF on, on this religious community goes horribly wrong, ATF agents are killed and wounded, and um, because the Brock Civilians return the firepower that they're met with, the FBI are called in and um, immediately set up two two kind of, if you like, two fronts um, on, on what is about to become a 51 day long siege. And on one front they, 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 they control very carefully the publicity of this event. And then on the other front they bring in their, their psychological warfare unit that has been practicing these techniques for the last um, 30 years or so and they start uh, using the Davidians as a kind of subject really in what becomes uh, actually a huge psychological experiment. In, in Waco in Texas. And the primary, um, the primary component of this experiment, if, if, that, if that's what we're going to call it, is the deployment of very, very loud and unusual noise, 24 hours a day. It's a kind of sensory deprivation. They also um, did other things like play around with the lights, um, maneuver tanks in threatening ways around the compound, and, um, and uh, blasted the compound with not just with audio but also with light for 24 hours a day. So the inhabitants in this in this community basically were, couldn't sleep and, and were subject to various forms of sensory deprivation. Um, the outcome of this event is really well known <coughs> that uh, a fire mysteriously starts in the compound. It's a subject of lots several lawsuits as to who started this fire, whether it was kind of the FBI were rogue FBI agents, or whether it was the community themselves in this kind of, kind of act of self-destruction. But at any rate, fire consumes the, uh, the compound, and only six people or so survive. <coughs> so in 2003, I set about um, 
wanted to remake elements of this psychological warfare program. I got in contact with one of the survivors, there were six survivors from this um, catastrophe, um, and I got in contact with one of them, a man called Clive Doyle, and um, he helped me reconstruct some of the audio that was used at the time that wasn't really publicly uh, talked about. I, I think it was more known now, but, but certainly at the time it was, um, it was definitely not reported. The media were held sort of two, three, four kilometres away from the actual compound, so they couldn't really see the kind of management, the, uh, the FBI's management of the siege at, at first hand. They had to rely on the kind of reports by the FBI officials. So I talked to Clive Doyle and, 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 and we kind of figured out what, what music was used and, and what sounds were used. And they are a very strange array, things like um, <coughs> babies crying very loudly, um, Nancy Sinatra singing, um, these boots are made for walking, slow down and speed it up. Um, the sound of the phone off the hook. I mean, a whole range, a whole very strange arsenal of, of noises. So I, I remade these noises and then um, constructed a kind of an event based around this where I, I um, invited some, some participants to experience this with me in a deserted sports stadium in um, the outskirts of London, well, outside of London, about an hour outside of London, um, in 2004. So what I'm going to show you now is some video clips of that. And uh, we start off outside the ICA. And the audience are um, about to embark on their coach journey to the site. They know what they're going to experience, but they don't really know exactly what's going to happen. And, um, and they don't also know where they're going. Did I ask you what you think is going to happen this evening? I have no idea. Probably all about music, noises. Yeah? Aside from that, who knows? Are you nervous? Not really. Not really? Not so far. No, you may be nervous. Okay. <laughs> Once you take it, please. Thank you. Go as far back as you can, and left to right. As far back as you can, left to right. Sir, can I see your ticket? Back as far as you can, left to right. Back as far as you can, left to right. Ticket, please. Back as far as you can, left to right. Back as far as you can, left to right. Thank you. So, you know, the byword for this was, was in, order to, in order to participate, you must comply. That was, the, um, that was kind of the instructions that the, the uniformed chaperones were told to um, um, inform everybody on. And part of the coach journey, uh, part, of that, part of that act of complying involved filling in a, a number of forms, um, which we're about to see now, um, asking for personal details, kind of practical things as well about having consent to be filmed. But there was a, there was, um, I was very interested in, in separating out the males and females um, and then um, imposing on people a set of sort of bureaucratic regulations. 
much actually in the same way that's happened in all kinds of conflict zones from, um, or civil war more kind of zones actually, from southern America to um, Bosnia um, from the 70s really through to the 90s and in a host of other, um, a host of other situations where this very similar kind of segregation happens. Um, so the next clip you're going to see is, is from the coach journey. Um, and I just also want to point out a starring role by uh, my friend Sarah here, who's also a long-term collaborator with me, where, who in one life is a compliance lawyer, and you'll see her in this clip trying to help people resist uh, filling in forms and giving, people their per giving me their personal details. So the next clip I'm going to show you is uh, the actual staging of the, of, of the event in the sports stadium. And um, you'll, you'll see that the thing I really want to emphasise is that we play the audio to, to the uh, participants, to the, audio, to the audience, um, at the same volume that the FBI played at, about 110, 120 decibels, which is pretty loud. Um, also, the other, thing that's, the other thing that's key about this is I kind of took the audience there um, and, and in a way, I, I slightly played a trick with them, in as much as actually the thing that I was really interested in was not actually particularly them experiencing the, uh, <coughs> the, the sounds in any kind of durational kind of way. The thing that actually I was most fascinated by and I thought was most interesting about this psychological warfare technique that the FBI had used was that it used um, the rebroadcasting of the telephone conversations between the FBI and David Koresh. So they were broadcast over the PA system all day long and all night. And, and I wanted to reconstruct some of that as well. So actually more than half of the experience in the sports stadium was actually listening to this clash of beliefs where you can see how these two people's worldview is really never ever going to meet for reasons that become you know, absolutely crystal clear when you, when you hear the transcript. Um, so that's really what you're going to hear, hear now. You're not going to hear very much audio, 
then we're going to hear some sort of phone dialogue. The phone dialogue is, is made from transcripts, it's word for word. Koresh and um, one of the FBI negotiators called Byron Sage. Um, and uh, what, what you hear them talking about are, is, is a kind of, in this particular time clip, is an argument about um, the FBI maneuvering vehicles around their, their compound. <laughs> of March, Finally, then, just to sort of wrap up, because um, I, 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 I think we should move on. Finally, then, just to wrap up, the other thing that I kind of want to draw your attention to in, in the sort of schema of this work was that it was really dependent on an audience. In fact, what I was very interested in doing was making a work that really composed, was composed of nothing but the staging and the audience. But there was no kind of you know, interstitial actual artwork involved. Um, and, and so in that sense, uh, and placing the audience you know, in this kind of arena, uh, with, with these lights on them. In, in, in a sense, what I want to do is construct the audience as, as the artwork, really. Um, okay, I think I should leave it there, and we should now have a discussion. Is that what we're going to do next year? Okay, thanks a lot.